streaming. Live streaming is on. <laughs> Sold out. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's suddenly springtime. <clears throat> yeah. And I, I don't know if you've been. Um... Oh, okay. It's working. She she can see us. Um. So yeah, I don't know if you've been uh, out uh, this week, but it's the city is full of people. Yeah, um, I've noticed that. And <laughs> like from one one part of me uh, has this feeling, oh Berlin in summertime, it's all back to normal, it's all nice. But the other part is like full of anxiety about another spike in cases that, that we're having and how irresponsible people can be just you know for for beer and stuff i, I don't mm -hmm. i don't know yeah um i've noticed that my it was not this weekend but um last weekend uh it must have been saturday no it must have been sunday and um my girlfriend and i were walking um through berlin back from my place to her place and we were walking through zo um and it was like i i told her I, there was nobody wearing a mask almost almost nobody wearing a mask wow. and I, and i told and i told her okay i am not walking through here unless we're both wearing masks so i kind of pushed her to wear a mask and i was wearing a mask because there was like just there was the it would look like a normal sunday in berlin i mean maybe without a few yeah. tourists but yeah it looked it looked just as crowded as any other sunday as if there was no pandemic and the only people you would see with masks on are the parents with their children. That's the only the only people you would see with masks on. So I was a little bit perturbed by that. Um, yeah. And um, <laughs> the, uh, the the I think that mm, we have to accept all those imp emotions in ourselves. But the first emotion that came to mind was these crazy people. Um, I mean. I, at, the, at, at some point they do what they want but i was just shocked that there were especially um uh there were a few police cars in the area there oh there always are near, near so you know and there's always a couple of those vans and um i mean i, I they're not going to go write tickets here and there but they should at least say something i thought because it was um just a huge volume of people with no masks in that in that very concentrated area but i am happy about the weather <laughs> <laughs> yeah um so apparently it's not allowed to just uh, sit uh, on the grass in groups uh, but uh, on the uh, banks of the uh, um, and the uh, larva canal apparently it's fine <laughs> Oh wait! Legally, or are you making a satire of the people sitting there? Um, no, I think, wait, wait, I, I need, I'll double check it uh, <laughs> before uh, spreading uh, misinformation. Um, Hi, Eva. Hello, Eva. Hey, um, um, so I just wanted to tell you that the stream is working. Uh, I nice. checked in the YouTube backend, so all good. This week, like last time, uh, uh, last week, I unfortunately didn't check, so that was the problem. So, but today, everything good. <laughs> thank you, Eva. Yeah, thank you. Um, that's that's no problem. Um, and now we know to test it before. Um, yeah. Actually, when uh, Shaham and I want, uh, were debugging it, <laughs> we kind of found that the issue was that I didn't that I had forgotten to um, to start the live stream in YouTube Studio, so the key went nowhere. Like even though the setup was right, uh, uh, the stream was never like received by YouTube. Yeah. Oh. 
I have a, I have a general question for you guys about the website. Um, oh, Ava popped out for a second. Um, uh, I don't, I don't know if you've been on there or been on the specific web pages I'm concerned about, but um, for me, whenever I check my web browser, uh, a different web browsers, Vivaldi, uh, Firefox, Chrome, or I, I, I go on my, or I go on my cell phone, um, there, there are changes I'm making, updates to the events page and the updates page, and I don't, I don't see them. I don't know if you noticed that. Can you see? Uh, for example, can you see the latest events on the website for the CBT events? Yeah. You can? Um, I'll check in a second. Oh, OK, um, OK, sorry. Hi, Lily. Lily. <laughs> Lily, have you been here before? Is this your first time at a, at a Berlin Stoics meetup? We can't hear you. Um, right, so under uh, events or updates? Uh, either, but I think the events page is what I'm most concerned about. Let's see. I can see only um, under upcoming events to the 7th of uh, February. Yeah, okay, so there is a problem. Okay, the... Um, uh, I keep updating it, and what's weird is that when I log into Wix to check the website, it's um it has all my events. It has this two CBT events since then, and the and this wow. event today. Um, but the problem is, is that um, oh, uh, we can't hear you either. Um... Hmm. Is there a place to set up? Mm. Let me try muting everyone. I can I have a, I have a setting. I can mute everyone and then unmute. So let me maybe I don't know if that works. Once muted. Oh, never mind. <laughs> mute once muted, you won't be able to unmute them. Yeah. Well, let me try that then. They, they can unmute themselves at any time. So oh. um, try unmute yourself. So, OK, now try to unmute yourself. One, two, one, two. OK, testing. Uh, Lily, can you hear us? Oh, no, OK. Um, I guess that didn't work. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, and uh, if us back. Hmm. Uh, Eva, can you hear us okay? Maybe this is a technical Yeah. Problem. Oh, okay, okay. No, I hear, uh, I hear you guys fine. Um, I just switched to my phone because I have to leave soon, okay. so that's why. Um, Lily can't even mute, unmute herself. Uh, so you can't even unmute yourself. Hmm. That's weird. Okay. Settings, no, that's just me. Oh, good to see you again, Tony. Hey, how are you, Steve? I am uh, I'm doing good. How are you doing? I'm excellent in every way. <laughs> <laughs> that's a lie. <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet everybody. Hello. Hello. Hello, Gonzalo. Uh, we're just uh, we're taking a pause for a second because uh, Lily uh, can't hear us and she hasn't been able to unmute herself. So we're just trying to fiddle with the settings. Sure. Yeah. So I think it's either. Can, can everybody else, Gonzalo, can uh, Tony, can you hear Shaham and I? Yes. Okay. Is is Eva on the phone? Yeah, she she looks like she's there. Yeah, is she talking? No, 
Ah, okay. right, right, right. Forgot about that. I'm, I'm double checking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, because, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, it's been a while since that happened. I think um, maybe more, moreover, Ava's, Ava was quite silent the past couple of meetings, or she's been, um, mm -hmm. she had been on her computer one time. So there, we hadn't, I completely forgot this problem. No, no, no I don't really. um, So my wife's here, but she's too shy to, um, to even say hello. <laughs> It's, it's quite okay. <laughs> okay, we we, uh, we we discuss stoicism every day, so I thought that she might be interested in um, joining in. Yeah. Then I yeah. okay, it's all right. <laughs> hey, I've, 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 okay, we lost we lost Lily. Um, yeah. Everybody can hear us, okay, right? Okay. We just wanted to make sure because uh, another um, uh, uh, one of our new participants, Lily, came in, couldn't hear us, and then she left. Ah, Lily, hi. Can you hear us now? No. Yes, I can't hear you. <laughs> hi, Lily. Hello, hello. So it's a very uh, male topic, huh? <laughs> we have had a, um, a struggling female presence here. Actually, Ava is here. Ava, uh, she, you notice the phone symbol on one of the um, uh, faces. Um, that's her, uh, but she usually hooks up with her phone, so she, you can never, you can never see her. Um, at least, at least, not too rarely. Um, uh, the Elena, very when we began in last year, we had Elena who came to several meetings. But yeah, this has been a male dominant topic, which is unfortunate. I think philosophy usually is a um, old white male topic, is the convention <laughs> that people think of in Western philosophy. <laughs> okay, not, right. it, it doesn't really help that they build their faces out of white marble. I think that's that. <laughs> Oh, okay. Okay, Philip. Um, so, wow, this is a, um, I think this is a, a bigger number of, of participants that I've seen you on here. I think my whole screen is crazy. Um This is wonderful. Good to see everybody. Um, uh, Lily, welcome. Um, you haven't been here, correct? This is your first meeting at yep. the Berlin Civics? Okay. Yes. Um, so what we like to do usually to begin off is um, introduce ourselves. Um, perhaps because a lot of our members maybe not have met each other because they've come to one meeting or another. And um, we do go around and we introduce each other. Um, so I'll start off. My name is Steve and I founded the Berlin Stoics in August of last year um, because I had wanted to join a Stoic group. I had been looking for a Stoic group for about a few weeks before that, and there had been one in meetup.com, but they hadn't been active for about a year. They had never met, never did anything. And I said, why not make one for myself? So, um, and it's been, a, it's been a success since then. I, am, I will preface this in every meeting. I am not an expert. I am not an authority on the subject. I just was introduced to it just like most of you were, and I thought that I could learn on the way along with you guys. So that's what we've been doing since then. Uh, I'm a teacher full-time in Berlin, um, and on the side, I do the Berlin Stoics. So how about we go around? Um, Lily, nice to meet you. Are you yeah, in Berlin? I am in Berlin, yes. Nice to meet you guys. Uh, I've been here for a year. So I came just before the pandemic <laughs> to one of the most exciting cities uh, in Europe. Um, <laughs> just not see it and not experience it at all. <laughs> but um, I am a digital marketer at specialized in YouTube ads, which is another male domain. <laughs> and I really don't mind um, being around uh, a lot more stoic, typically more stoic people, I guess, than, than most women are um, very emotional, I guess. I am, I think, a bit of a nerd, but um, yeah. Well, this, this is all the categories or the boxes I will put myself in now. <laughs> um, what else? Yeah, I, 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 I'm really, really a newbie to uh, philosophy. I do think that I... I always read like bits and pieces here and there, but I'm still missing like the bigger picture to, to fully 
understand the different types and um and yeah to um yeah have a better understanding generally of uh, philosophy i think that's why i'm here um i will pass on to gonzalo Okay, so hello, my name is Gonzalo. I've uh, joined the Berlin Stoic Group, I think it was um, two months ago or something like that. Um, I've also um, migrated to Berlin on November 2019, so I, kind of like four months before pandemic <laughs> started. Um, I'm a software engineer, I work on software development. Um, I'm really interested in, in philosophy, and I think that Stoicism is one of the, let's say, more practical ones. It's not just a question to destroy your brain that stops working and that's it. It's a nice question. Uh, I, I think it's Stoicism is really about um, the, um, the difficulty of us living all together, and, and, and I really like that. Um, I'm also a Buddhist. Um, I become a Buddhist around uh, five years ago. Um, I'm from Argentina, and that's basically it, I think. Um, I will pass on to Eva then. I'm not sure she can hear us. Um... She can. Okay. She just needed a minute to to get to the phone and unmute herself. So uh, my name is Eva. Um, I think I have joined um, Stokes meeting in November uh, 2020, but I don't. That's what I remember, but I don't know for sure. And I stumbled upon Stoicism in 2019 when I went through a really like difficult phase in my life and. I loved it because it made me feel stronger and it's still going on. So that's why I'm here. Thank you, Eva. Um, you want to pass the baton to somebody? <laughs> ah, shit. Ah, shit. I forgot. Um, <laughs> I passed the mic. Okay. I don't see who's here. So I, don't, I know Shacham is here. So I passed to Shacham. All right. All right. Um, well, I joined uh, the Berlin uh, Stoics uh, um, at, uh, I think, meetup uh, number minus one uh, because Steve couldn't uh, come to the first one. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Um, I always um, was interested in, in philosophy, but in a very, I don't know, dry and academic uh, way. Um, and just uh, when I started uh, getting interested uh, in Stoicism, I saw the yeah the practical um, uh, sides and philosophy as a way of, of life. And I think it's um, really the basis uh, of the framework uh, for my life uh, in this last, uh, I don't know, yeah, like year and a half uh, or so. Yeah, so uh, Tony, you to go ahead? Yeah, sure, so my name's Tony. Um, unfortunately, I don't live in Berlin, although I would love to. Been to Berlin a few times. Um, I'm actually in Poland at the moment. I run a company between Poland and the UK, originally from Liverpool. Um, Traveled to many different places, um, had many different types of experiences, and Stoicism really over the last year has generally helped um, in many different ways. Um, but I'm very new to Stoicism, so I don't know all the all the characters yet um, in the plot line um, or the narrative um, in general. But it's really interesting to me, and like you guys, I like the practical element of um, how stoicism can be applied to your general mind view and um, you, it can really help in your day-to-day -day activities, yeah. So I don't have anyone's name, 
on my screen. How would do, Philip? Hi, yeah, uh, I'm Philip. Um, I've been part of this group since, um, I want to say late November last year. Um, I've lived in Berlin since just a little over a year. Um, and yeah, my, my interest in interest in stoicism is maybe dates back like about two years or so. Um, and for a long while, I've, I've made it a really active part of my daily um, practice, my daily routine. Um, recently, I've been struggling a little bit more, but um, I'm also a huge uh, nerd. Uh, <laughs> I've, um, yeah, there's always like one book or another that um, I put my bedside that I'm reading about some like philosophical topic, not, necess not necessarily just stoicism, but either um, in a general philosophy or maybe or not reading a biography of Seneca. So something that's always kind of philosophy adjacent and I'm uh, actively trying to get back to um, yeah, incorporating the practice more into my daily um, routine again. That's my, um, yeah, my, my difficulty right now, let's say. Um, I think the only one who hasn't introduced himself is Abdul. So I'll pass the mic to him. Yeah, thanks. Oops, what's happening there? Can you see me, folks? Good. Hi there. Um, my name is Abdul Rahman. You can call me Abdul for short. People are having a hard time saying my name. Um, yeah, I'm from Saudi Arabia, uh, and I study in Edinburgh, the UK. Uh, I'm studying mechanical and energy engineering. And yeah, um, I've been uh, introduced to Sto to Stoicism uh, when I was uh, looking up videos on YouTube two years ago um, about self-control and uh, practical wisdom. And yeah, so uh, the story began with Stoicism. I've been exposed to the Stoic materials since then, but uh, I guess I, I, I wanted to, I, I just said, let me up on my game and just join a club and Ex further explore stoicism. Um, yeah, happy to be with you. Thanks. Back to you, Steve. I think I'm the last one. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Abdul. Thank you, everybody. A um, uh, couple of reminders, um, just usual things before we begin a meeting. Um, the first thing is, and I'm, I'm, I do apologize for this, but um, I, I do, we, we do have to be a bit more cautious the next time. But um, we uh, would like to record. We actually are recording now. Um, we do like to record our meetups live. If you do not prefer the uh, the meetup is recorded, can you please say so now? And we can we can stop. That's okay. Um, but if you can just say so now, um, and we can stop the recording. And otherwise, otherwise we can continue. Okay. Um, and the second thing is now with. Um, eight of us, please uh, raise your hands. And so use the, the raise your hand function. I don't know if you see, if you're on the laptop, there's a, um, I guess a, a right or a left hand, depending on if you see it as a as, a, as yours or the something in a mirror that it's on the bottom left. I'm not sure if Ava has that capability. Uh, there's also a, the problem with Ava on the phone. So um, sometimes for some of you, you may not be able to hear her when she speaks. Um, because she's on the phone, we've had that technical problem before. Um, so if she starts to speak while somebody else is starting to speak, um, because she may not be able to raise her hand while on the phone, uh, I may bump in and just ask that um, uh, Ava pause um, or you pause, depending on who's been speaking more and who may deserve an extra turn at um, uh, contributing to the conversation. And then I'll, I'll kind of provide a wait list for anybody who wants to speak. Um, so. Thank you for everybody for joining. Um, this is a great turnout, and I'm happy to see all the regulars here. Um, uh, uh, um, thank you for Abdul, especially for um, so uh, I've been incredibly busy this week. And originally, we were going to start the topic today on the passions, uh, which is a topic uh, recommended by Abdul. Um, and I thought that um, we're going to postpone that for just a week. So the schedule for the next three weeks is that I thought it might be best because in my research on the passions, I noticed that the, the, the idea of the passion in Stoicism actually derives ultimately from Chrysippus. Um, he had an entire work called On, on the Passions, um, which doesn't really survive. You can only find fragments of the passions in works like Cicero. 
um, or other medieval scholars. And um, uh, but he basically wrote. Uh, I think we lost uh, Steve for a second. A four <laughs> volume tractus yeah. on the Stoic philosophy of mind. Um, sorry? We lost you yes, for a moment. Of seconds. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, and what it. Yeah. Um, how long should we wait? I can send him a message on Telegram. Yeah, I think something. something Might be uh, uh, what <laughs> the philosophy of mind was. Oh, uh, Steve, uh, I think you're having a, a very difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Can you all hear me now? Now, yes. Okay, yeah, everybody froze for a second, and I assume it was me. That was the problem. Um, I couldn't even see the chat. You guys were writing on the chat. I couldn't even see that. So um, I apologize. Um, let me introduce my uh, th th this meeting again. So today we're going to be talking about the early Stoics um, and focus on Zeno and Chrysippus, um, because I thought that starting with the early Stoics would be a nice preclude uh, to the next two weeks on the Passions. Um, because Chrysippus, as it turns out, not only wrote on the passions, he also founded, beyond Zeno, some of the most integral parts of Stoic philosophy that we know of today. Um, I don't want this to be too structured because I kind of like an open discussion. We're all pretty used to that. Um, however, with eight people, um, I and because I never asked you to prepare with any reading or material or to come with anything, there's just gonna be a couple of slides and I'm also going to provide some light frog and some prompts for everybody to base this discussion off of. Um, and then from there, we can have a more open discussion. We can go through each of the light frog. Um, and I think that would be more, more meaningful and valuable for us. Um, something I'm interested in, and I can show you the, the resources that I found at the end of the slide. Um, let me share you my screen. Um, application window and the PowerPoint. Okay, um, I don't want to make this a full screen um, because if I do, I no longer see everybody and I longer, no longer have the functionality of using um, the screen for the raise the hand function or seeing who's raising their hand. Um, so if you don't mind this uh, sidebar on the side. Um, so I did title this discussion, The Philosophy of Mind, but I thought another title would have been The Early Stoics. Um, these are a few prompts uh, that we can use. Um, the biggest discussion I think would, would be worthwhile um, is basing our discussion around the idea, is stoicism deterministic? Does it include any possibility of free will? Um, and can we control anything outside of our minds? Um, this is what something that Chrysippus had really, really focused on. Um, if we look at a little bit of a timeline, um, I'll get back to the light frog, and, but I think it's also useful to kind of have a good summary of who Zeno was and who Chrysippus was. Um, but as most of you know probably already, their works don't survive. Um, their works have been lost. Uh, Chrysippus, there are fragments, but Zeno's works, for example, which um, he did write a lot. There are reports that he wrote pro prolifically, but they, nothing survives. Um, if you're interested, um, you can find uh, a lot of his, at least not source material, but the earliest source material we have from him is on Diogenes, um, Lies of Eminent Philosophers. He also goes into Chrysippus as well, not just, you know. Um, so a lot of what we know about the early Stoics comes from him. Um, we all know the famous story is, you know, um, he was shipwrecked, found a book in a bookstore by Socrates, which is also now lost. And uh, the man pointed to someone he could be taught from, uh, the Crates the Cynic. And so uh, Stoicism was originally um, founded from cynicism. Um, another interesting fact I actually found out, I had never known this, um, something that I found out in my research was that Zeno was um, 
considered one of the earliest Western anarchists. Um, he wrote a book called Republic, um, which is not for no reason. It was in opposition to Plato's The Republic. Um, and Plato ultimately went back and forth and decided on a kind of a utopia, uh, utopian state, um, the Republic. But uh, Zeno kind of imagined this um, uh, state of nature and state of reason. Everybody could rely on using reason to live peacefully and with other people socially um, instead of a need for external rules. Um, and he... he uh, what I found interesting was that uh, one of the sources I found um, wrote that he also imagined kind of an egalitarian society in this in, in this future utopia. Um, uh, men and women are somewhat equal. Um, of course, you have to take that with a grain of salt um, and what details he might have provided um, about that egalitarianism, but he more or less uh, um, abhorred slavery and wanted a more egalitarian way of life um, where everybody practiced reason in order to live communally and within nature. Um, uh, he, he had some basic tenets of Stoicism already in place. For example, he accepted the idea of fate, um, the idea that there was a common source for everything. So um, I think it's different than the philosophical concept of first cause, um, but he basically founded this tenet of Stoicism that we know of today, um, that there is, um, he accepted fate as a common cause for everything, um, that you ultimately can't really control anything external to yourself because um, that was up to fate and you had to leave it to that. Um, although he didn't, as you know, uh, did not distinguish between internal and external events. Um, and while he also founded the idea of acceptance, it wasn't until Chrysippus um, really found a Stoicism as we know it today. Um, from my research, it's pretty clear that Chrysippus was the start of Stoicism. Um, and Zeno was the kind of, I guess, the fire, and Chrysippus was the writer. He was the person to really philosophize about it. Um, he's the one who to break up to Stoicism into logic, ethics, and physics. And um, he was the one to distinguish between internal and external events, which is where we can get into our discussion now. Um, he was the one to distinguish between those events within and those without our control. And he, he further also, um, just to go into a little bit of philosophy of mind, he did distinguish those two events pretty clearly as those mental versus physical. Um, that pretty much anything physical, there's, there's an element that we cannot control that these are external events, even our bodies. Um, there are some things that our bodies do that we cannot control completely. It is our minds that are really within our control, um, at least 100%. Um, I wanna start with one of the prompts and ask perhaps as a first discussion point, um, perhaps without going into, and there is evidence, maybe I can bring up later as a, a separate topic discussion, um, that Chrysippus did advocate for a kind of compatibilism, that there is an idea of free will in this world of determinism. Um, however, um, outside of us, at least, at least in the physical world, not without our minds, um, there is a heavy emphasis in Stoicism that everything's left up to fate without our control. Mm. But I'll leave this up as to an open discussion. Is Stoicism really deterministic? Is it really telling us um, that, mm, not that it's against free will, maybe that's a second question that we can pose, but the first question, is Stoicism deterministic um, that the world is determined from cause to effect um, without any of our influence um, able to change that. Uh, I'm struggling a little bit with that question, mainly because I don't think that I understand the concept of deterministic correctly, let's say. Okay. Um, are you, um, I, I guess there's always a, a distinction between determinism with regard to um, uh, the physical nature of things and the kind of the human component of things. Um, 
I think what I'm asking is, um, is so I'm not talking about, I mean, Stoicism and I guess the, a lot of the early Greeks had also thought that um, uh, and there were atoms and they bounced around and ultimately the physical world was caused by this. But what I mean by deterministic is human relations, society, and are the external events between humans that are outside of us as individuals, are they deterministic? I guess that's what I'm talking about because that's, um, Chrysippus had um, uh, considered those as external events too. They're not just physical events, so to speak. They're also events that other people um, are, are participating in outside of us as individuals. Um, so I guess this deterministic, what I'm asking is, do the, did the Stoics and does Stoicism really necessitate that we believe any event, even human and social outside of us, is um, predetermined without our influence changing that? Do we have any ch ability um, to help determine those events outside of us? And this includes political, social, and other events. I'm not sure if I answered your question or if I'm being very clear, um, but perhaps this is just a bad way of, of phrasing the question. Uh, yeah, Tony. Hey, you're on mute. All right, can you hear me? Yeah. Right, okay, sorry. I think the my, my own understanding of predeterminism is largely from the sort of Christian a tradition which is obviously monotheistic so you'd, you'd have a god who's controlling everything and whatever you did you had no free will um i don't think that's the case with stoicism from what i know obviously because um we were able to control events um which are within our control so by definition we do have an element of control over what happens um how that affects the larger situation to society i wouldn't know um but i don't think stoicism is deterministic from what i understand um i don't know what you guys think shakam uh, i don't think it's uh, deterministic in a very a strict way. Um, there is the idea of fate and how we should uh, accept uh, external events that uh, are outside of our control. And if it was fully deterministic, we'll have no control even on our inner actions and thoughts. It's all, you know, a uh, like even stronger than, than fate, it's all predetermined. It's um, nothing we can do will change uh, the future. And um, if I can repeat uh, from wait, is it two meet two meetups ago or more? Can't remember. Um, about the difference between uh, being a, a leaf. Uh, in the in the wind without any control or a uh, being a uh, in a in a fast moving river i think um in stoicism you're more uh, like in the river you can you can swim you can try to fight uh, the currents uh, you can uh, avoid the rocks uh, on your way you can't control the river itself, where it will flow. This is fate. But you're not a, just a leaf in the wind without any co control, without any agency. Um, so for me, that's the, as far as I understand, the level of uh, determinism uh, Stoics, like the Stoics believed. Um, yeah, as far as I, as I understand. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
Yeah, I would agree. It's not, um, I mean, of course, there's a physical aspect of Stoicism and they believed in, in at least in their, right, in their, their domain of physics, that there is a deterministic world. But outside of that, um, I think um, Chrysippus had really struck hard on this dichotomy between physical and um, uh, mindful or mental. Um, and anything mindful he had generally included, I see, okay, I see you, Lily, um, uh, clumped into this deterministic world. Um, but um, uh, freedom, um, as opposed to the deterministic world, um, I um, am not sure he would have, at least in the early Stoics from what I read, um, he wouldn't have advocated so, so lightly um, an element of free will that we have outside of us on any external events. Um, I think this is a more modern Stoic interpretation that we have a little bit more agency outside of us um, than we previously had thought, which is a good thing. I think it's a good injection. We kind of keep the dichotomy between external and internal events and the control that we have over one or the other. And, but we still kind of, um, it's like keeping the goalposts, but just moving them a bit, a, a few yards this way or that way. Um, and you're just changing the perspective at some point. And I think that's what we've been doing over the course of the centuries is that keeping that same framework, but moving the goalposts. And so we're able to have a little bit more agency, but not, um, uh, we still have a deterministic world, but at least we can help determine that. We have a bit more agency outside of that physical external uh, determinism um, outside of us. Lily? Yeah, I agree with you guys. I think uh, you both said it, um, maybe for me to say it in a different way, is the choice is already if we want to live stoic or not, right? And the way you react to your outside situations or your outside uh, environment, that changes it, the way you react to it. And therefore, it cannot be fully deterministic. Because otherwise, then it we it wouldn't even matter if we are stoicists or if we are I don't know hysterics or whatever. Do you know what I mean? If there's nothing that we can have an impact on or change, then um, we wouldn't have to make this choice. But since we can, this is the thing that we can control. Um, yeah, we we it, it cannot be deterministic in, in my point of view. Gonzalo? You're on mute. I lower my hand, but not my unmute myself. Um, I also think that as, as Lily just mentioned, uh, I, I also think that it's, it's, it's impossible for it to be, um, let's say fully deterministic, but I also think that there's Kind of like this understanding of um, that that depending on on whether how much you zoom in or zoom out out of the determinate um, situations, you can see that the the connection in between all the moving parts um, and and up to which point that um, let's say you reach for, for control, let's say. Um, I don't know, maybe um, in your family, you can request everybody to be a vegan and that's the limit of your control, let's say, and, and your impact. Um, but I, I think that um, beyond that circle, let's say, where, where everybody's really close and connected, I, I don't think that you can influence too much. Uh, you will, but not in that sense of, of depression right it's like i can only influence so small i can change so small but rather than you will need other types of mechanisms in order to move it let's say um, or something like that uh thank you guys yeah it's um uh, I, I guess just to add a little flavor but we are all pretty certain that it's not completely deterministic um they do fall into a, a into a com compatibilist camp um, but it's interesting, um, they, um, so far back as Chrysippus, um, I think even Zeno, um, 
there are some reports in, so for example, um, there was a good article on Zeno's um, Republic and they note uh, an apparent contradiction um, between Stoicism's um, um, somewhat hard line about um, external events and Zeno's anarchistic, I mean, this is Zeno himself. This is not Stoicism generally. I think Sto Stoicism past Zeno kind of um, let go of Zeno's um, political um, beliefs. But it's interesting that Zeno had this huge anarchistic belief and uh, which is a which huge, like gives grants a lot of freedom to the individual um, in society, um, but still, and uh, actually, thinks that the individual has a huge role to play in society and can change a lot. Whereas Stoicism traditionally has been um, more deterministic. Um, but I think, I think that was, I, 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 I don't think, um, because I remember our discussions about Epictetus, Epicurean is not Epictetus, um, Epicurus and, and um, Zeno, Stoicism versus Epicureans. And if you remember Epicureans, well, were very against participating in public life for society. Um, they, they never wanted to. Let, let me put my camera on because I think we can, um, I can always switch back to the slide as well and helps you to see my face. Um, that, um, uh, um, that the Epicureans were the one to really avoid public life. Whereas the Epicurean, uh, the Stoics, Stoics starting from Zeno really wanted to, to engage in public life. And I think it's only because he emphasized that from the beginning. I think this is one of Zeno's greatest contributions is that besides his idea of acceptance of external events, um, his idea of being a participatory in outside life was a helpful balance to the hard determinism that Chrysippus would put put inject into stoicism. Um, I think it helped stoicism become compatibilist. That was my feeling that um, that um, this especially emphasis on engagement in pol public and political life that the Stoics advocated for um, was really powerful. Um, there was another point that Chrysippus had made um, and just looking back, I think, um, and, and this is this is some from the sources you guys can find um, uh, in the in the meetup discussion, the meetup description that I had put on there. That um, it looks like um, uh, the idea of free will never really entered into their minds. Um, the idea of will, uh, not so much as character. Um, was really emphasized. I think what they did was they, and we had talked about duty uh, many sessions ago. We had a couple of discussions on duty and responsibility. Um, and they had, uh, I think the Stoics emphasis on responsibility to engage in public life um, had really um, turned the perspective from free will to with whatever you can do to change other events outside of yourself, um, you have a responsibility to, um, and that was their kind of definition of free will, that um, uh, as opposed to the deterministic world outside of us, um, there is some range of responsibility that you have to do something. Even if you can't affect change, um, you still have the responsibility to. I think, um, I found that an interesting perspective that Chrysippus talked about that, um, and th these are from secondary sources because we have nothing of his own writing, but the secondary sources that I had read emphasized that the Stoics were um, more about responsibility. They kind of accepted the idea that you just don't even ask yourself, can I change this? Just ask yourself, do I have a responsibility to do something about it? Um, and, then, and then they went ahead and, and did something and acted. Um, Chrysippus emphasized, this was a big idea that I found, that he emphasized that um, uh, they, our actions belong to us, that our actions, although are determined, um, they belong to us because um, uh, our actions are determined by our decisions, 
and our actions are ultimately determined by um, what we think we can do. We can do something about. Um, if otherwise, our actions are just reactions, and that's something the Stoics kind of pushed back against. That our actions shouldn't be just mere reactions um, from something else. Um, this is this kind of leads into the passions um, that our actions shouldn't be just effects of our passions or our raw emotions um, reacting from what some, somebody else did to us or from an, an external event that we're upset about. Um, so I think that the Stoics were largely compatibilist, although I think Chrysippus was more, was more deterministic, but he did accept the idea that there was a, there was an element of responsibility um, because he kind of, he kind of put that in that sphere of um, uh, internal events um, kind of just outside us. Um, I think he never really expressly talked about um, reactions or um, to things, um, but he he kind of he kind of started talking about it when he talked about the idea of responsibility and emotions. Um, I think if nobody else has anything else to add, um, I can go on to the next prompt. But I'll I'll stop speaking. Uh, sometimes I speak too much. So, okay, Gonzalo. I think you just said uh, he'll be right back. Yeah. Um, I think we've come to a point where we can answer the second prompt. Um, does Stoicism exclude the possibility of free will, or is it rather compatibilist? I mean, I think we all accept the idea that there's some element of free will, but I think the idea of responsibility is a bit better. Um, I also like the word, when I, when I saw that, Read, written about Chrysippus, um, that made him think of Viktor Frankl. And Viktor Frankl had always talked about the idea of, he never said responsibility, he liked to use the word responsibleness. Um, and he talked about responsibleness in human nature to act. Um, but is stoicism limited? Um, is stoicism limited that we can only control what is within our minds and nothing physically external to us? Because I mean, the reason why I answer this question, I know we accept the idea that there's a compatibilist nature about the world. We have a, f a freedom to act, and but most of the world is deterministic outside of that, right? These external events. But why I'm, why I'm specifically focusing on the mental and the physical is um, I noticed that um, that's an interesting dichotomy. If you only accept what's within our control is mental, not in the negative way of speaking about it, but in, in other words, mindful, um, then, then most of what happens to our bodies, most of what happens in our immediate physical sphere is outside of our control. This was a hempy emphasis that Chrysippus um, put on this dichotomy. Um, but I guess what I'm really asking is, um, is that really true? Is that, I mean, is the mind the only thing that we can control within ourselves? Or, or is, is, can we control more? But the early Stoics simply emphasized the mind to control because that was the only thing we can really be sure we can control. I don't know if you understand my difference, but what if the Stoics didn't really intend that everything was deterministic, but in order to prevent us from distressing about external events we can't control, just accept the fact that what we can be sure we can control is is the mind. Um, Philip, and then, I'm sorry, I, I saw both of you around the same time. Uh, is it Philip then Lily, I think I saw in that order? Doesn't matter, all good. Oh, okay, Philip. Am I now unmuted? I find it so yeah. difficult to see in this interface, cool. Um, yeah, I, I would actually um, absolutely agree with this sentiment um, that it is entirely limited um, or just entirely um, within ourselves, the realm of the things that we control. Um, and um, one of the um, the nicest pictures that I've seen that I've come across is, um, I think, Cato um, wrote about the um, an archer um, and he gave the idea of, you know, you can do everything, um, 
to prepare. You can, you know, you can control your breathing, you can control your aim, um, your steady hand. Um, but once you let go of the arrow, um, everything is decided. And there might be a sudden, you, you know, your aim might be perfect, your hand perfectly steady, but there's a gust of wind that blows your arrow um, away from the target. And so um, in the same kind of um, vein or in the same kind of idea, I would say that um, it is only um, our uh, mind, our thoughts and actions that we truly control because as soon as we affect the world around us, um, it might have consequences that we didn't anticipate. And so um, this kind of fits very nicely with this, um, as you said, this, this limited, uh, or yeah, what do you call it? limited, let's say, um, that really the only thing we do absolutely control where we have perfect control over is just our minds and the physical world. Um, there's always, um, yeah, a large degree of, of uncertainty of things that are um, absolutely not within our control. Uh, Lily? So I think this would be true maybe in a world where there was no internet and uh, where the speech wasn't like amplified in this many ways, but like imagine if Trump was a stoicist and he, he would have spoken different, then the, the capital wouldn't have gotten stormed. I mean, like, am I mixing things up or is it, is, does that not play a role? Like, do you mean physical things as in nature only or the way that people react and, and um, how, uh, yeah, how, how mad <laughs> they can go to things that you say actually? Okay, I was just waiting to see if anybody else raised their hand. Um, yeah, I, I think um, the it, it you guys. I'm very happy you guys answered differently <laughs> because I'm not sure if this is just a matter of interpretation, like um, uh, of, of the interpretation of what the Stoics meant. I think this is really a question. Like, did, do the Stoics um, really believe that um, the mind is the only thing we can control, or is it just the only thing we can be sure we can control? And it's we should kind of give up trying to control anything else. But I, um, I'm wondering if there's not kind of an escape. Uh, what's the word? A loophole in the Stoic logic that you can um, kind of by the transitive property. Um, if Trump was able to control his mind and his actions, um, then he could, by the transitive property control, it's difficult because even if he did that, I mean, I guess this is maybe a, a cheap example, <laughs> but I'm not sure. What if Trump went, acted the way he did all the way up until the very moment that he made the speech to his followers at, at the Capitol? And he just, he just like, he bewildered them. He surprised them. All of a sudden he turned stoic. He was, uh, he, he, he spoke monastically. He wore monastically. Um, and, uh, you know, could he have controlled what the people would have done? Um, uh, I mean, just not, you know, just excluding the kind of political world we were in back then. And we start, we still are in, um, with, would he have been able to influence what they did next? Um, and I think for me, the, the Stoics weren't, I mean, I guess you could to an extent, you could influence, you could try to change. But I think the Stoics, especially with people, I think Lily brings up a good point that it's not, um, the Stoics concern is not external, physical, inanimate things that were not living. I mean, if uh, I'm just looking at the boat, in back of you, Philip, that um, if you're trying to handle the boat and create it and make it, um, and it all of a sudden falls apart, maybe that's a faulty error in the way it was, um, the parts were manufactured and sent to you. So that's out of your control and that's really out of your control. But um, uh, could you really manipulate people? And I think psychologically there's an extent you can, but I think ultimately, I think the Stoics were trying to make the point that the first cause, their, their kind of idea of the first primary cause of your actions will always be your decisions. Um, and I think the Stoics would have, I think, 
we would have had something to say about it, right? I mean, obviously Trump has a responsibility to act and say, speak differently. But um, I think the Stoics would have looked at the storming of the Capitol and said, well, um, the responsibility is obviously with Trump, but partly the responsibility is also those people that they have a responsibility to decide how to act. And they, they that responsibility also falls on them. Um, I'm not sure if that solves the problem of stopping the people from storming the Capitol, but um, I'm not sure the Stoics also would have had a clear answer because I think they would have said, well, that's the consequence of what he did. And, um, and that's a consequence of, of what they had chose to do. So um, I, I would, I would maybe side in the middle, but I would tend towards Philip's answer. I would tend towards Philip's answer and, and say that really what is up to our control is really within our minds. Um, I think Stoicism is limited in that respect, not in that we should expand it, but that really what is ultimately in our control is our minds and the actions that we can we can decide to take from there. Uh, Shakam. Yeah, I wanted to, um, uh, I don't know if it's uh, to answer or to uh, uh, continue this line of uh, thought. Um, I think the Stoics uh, believed that uh, really what happens to our body, uh, what's going on with nature, it's not uh, under our control. Uh, it's, it comes uh, from you know, the nature of things. Now, I think, nowadays, we are more informed about, about our um, ability to influence what happens to our own uh, body, what's uh, uh, going on uh, with nature. So I suggest instead of a uh, Epictetus a dichotomy of uh, control, we can have a, a trichotomy of control, um, a influence, and no, a, how say, and not and none 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 of the control. Um, instead of just things you you can and can't control, you have things inside your sphere of influence you can choose to eat uh, healthy you can choose uh, to buy more green and ecological uh, products you can choose uh, and try to incite a, a storming of, uh, <laughs> of the seat of power uh, and trump didn't control anybody apart from his actions but his actions his words influenced a lot of people um the word populist and uh, state state people are also in the stoics uh, times yeah and they uh, try to uh, control also a lot of people it's nothing new um and i'm not sure they really wrote about it. I don't know if, uh, if somebody uh, can see. Um, mm. um, yeah. I'm going to go to uh, Philip and then Gonzalo, because I saw Philip's hand raised first. Oh, again, with the muting. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, and um, I just wanted to um, maybe conclude that um, the, let's say the, I don't want to say the way out, but um, how you can still be an active um, part, like, you, like you're saying, like trying to influence, trying to affect um, the world around you is by practicing um, something that, um, I don't know if that's the technical term, I always say light attachment to whatever it is that you're doing, um, that you try to do um, the right thing um, whatever that may be in a given situation, but you also totally accept that however it um, might, or whatever effect it might have in the world around you, it might not be the effect that you're um, hoping for, that you're trying for. So as, as long as you're aware of, of that and you're just resting in yourself saying that I'm in control of my intentions, of the things that I'm thinking, of the things that I'm trying to achieve um, with my behavior um but letting go of um the idea that um 
that means that the result must be x, y, or z. Um, this light attachment to the outcome is something that allows you still to um, be active, for example, in politics, in your community, in trying to um, yeah, have a have a change in the world, even though you know that probably um, things might not actually end up um, in in the way that you expect them. Um, before before Gonzalo, you speak, I just want to say this is a nice transition because Gonzalo is a Buddhist, and this whole idea of attachment, I'm really interested to hear what he has to what he has to say. So Gonzalo, um, you're up. Um, yeah, I. I kind of like my my question was more related to to, to um, whether if we are going to see control as an absolute thing, as, as something like uh, the world has to bend to my will. Uh, now plastic will turn into gold, sort of thing. Um, if if we are kind of like aiming to that theory of control then we are absolutely screwed, of course. Uh, I think that that's, that that's completely impossible for us. Um, we are as much of the universe as the universe is as much of us, right? It, it's like we are also atoms and we cannot find that much amount of atoms changing other atoms around, uh, unless of course there, are, there is a nuclear explosion or something. But um, I think that besides those uh, rather extreme scenarios, um, we we let's say we must um I, i'm not sure if the dichotomy of control is just that it's like okay um uh, i might um you know uh, kind of like i might prepare to to reach the target but the moment i release the arrow the problem is no longer mine <laughs> and that's it um that sort of of if if we are aiming towards that um, I, I also don't think that that we have, let's say, some influence. I think that the, also the problem is related to the amount of knowledge that you have about um, how how some things work. Uh, I don't know. For me, the body is a, a, a so complicated system that we sometimes uh, forget that some results are not related to what our own actions let's say um for example i don't know inside our body there's an 80 percent of um microbes working for us and creating things that we can influence by feeding them or or not right uh, but sometimes another one appears and has unforeseen consequences because of that and thus those consequences create another thing and another thing and another thing and it's a snowball effect that uh, it's really outside of, of of the control so you might start something with one idea but the results will be completely i don't know um yeah and un un unforeseeable of some sort let's say so i try to release the control out of it uh, rather than um, focus on um, let's say I, I, I rather focus on my intentions and my emotions rather than anything else uh, I think that that's the only place where I can go thank you Gonzalo um, Shakam yeah I wanted to um... Uh, to continue with uh, the idea of um, the level of knowledge uh, increases the level of control uh, or influence if we're not going uh, with uh, absolute uh, uh, terms and we, we I think we can see that uh, the ancients um, knew very little about um, I don't know nature of the universe or just the physical um, phenomenon. So thunder came from the th thunder go god. Um, and now uh, we know a bit more about uh, how uh, thunder is created. So we don't need uh, to think about gods and their will 
and their control uh, on, on our life. Um, and, and so my, my question is, with more knowledge, the external uh, events seem less deterministic. How does it apply to our inner uh, life? Because can, can we have complete knowledge of uh, our inner workings? Like you said, with the microbes, maybe they have um, a bit more sugar to, uh, to process, uh, so we feel better, more en energetic. If they don't, don't have enough, uh, then maybe uh, we feel a, a bit um, angry and short-tempered. So, so yeah. So this is this is my question. How can we get, or how can we know, <laughs> the level of knowledge we 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 have of our inner workings and uh, the origins of our thoughts and feelings? What do you guys say? Um, actually, I just wanted to make a point, and then I'll go to you, Gonzalo. Um, I really like the transition, though, because um, it makes me think that perhaps the Stoics, and it's unfortunate we lost so much of their works in the early ones, but um, I wonder if this is a, a reason why they focus so much on emotions, because they ultimately said that um, it's it's not a question, and I really like the re refocus, because we keep saying, what do we have control over? But what if that's not what they started with? What if the Stoics thought, um, well, it's not about control, it's about knowledge. And because the only thing we can sh be sure about in terms of our knowledge is our is our own internal workings. Right? We, we, it's, um, it, it's taken us generations to talk about um, the, the physics of how a satellite should orbit the earth, um, how a ball fall, even how a ball falls to the ground. But from the ancients, we, we already knew a little bit about our emotions. And I wonder if this is a problem of knowledge, like Gonzalo was saying, because what if that kind of, it started as knowledge, it started as, well, this is, um, uh, we only have knowledge about our emotions, at least more knowledge about our emotions than other things. And we can have knowledge about, more knowledge about our emotions than other things. So this is the only thing we ha can have control over. I wonder if there was that tight relationship between knowledge and control that we didn't we didn't think to think to look for in in the rest of Stoicism. Something I've never heard of before. Maybe there's more uh, an epistemological uh, element of Stoicism um, that is undercurrent, kind of subtle in in the rest of the Stoic philosophy, because there's not really any explicit mention of um, epistemology or philosophy of knowledge in Stoicism. Uh, it's more about the acting on that knowledge and control. Um, but I wonder if that influences it. But Gonzalo and then um, Tony. Uh, yes, and I also think that that's, um, or at least inside my, um, kind of like my mind, I see this um, kind of like a, a three-step thing, right? Uh, you start feeling something, you start thinking something, and then you have the choice to move or to keep thinking, right? So for, for me, it's like this three-step thing um, of um, something starts, um, then the thinking comes, and then I have, and then the movement comes. Um, so in this in in this three-step thing, um, I think that you can, and the, the the reason why the Stoics choose movement, kind of like they choose to 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 do things related to things is because you can keep thinking forever and not do anything about it. You can keep thinking that you need more knowledge in order to understand something forever and never try anything. And I think that the short part to that is to try something really small and to experiment with something really small and, and see what happens. And you start with another thing more small and, and then you, you kind of like, um, which I think it's the nerd part inside of me, like the software development that, that, that sees um, iterations and small changes. <laughs> I, I think that I see that everywhere <laughs> now, uh, but I think that it's it makes complete sense for me because I've been blocked by by brain and by by thought a lot. In in kind of like, do I have enough information in order to understand this situation, 
all the outcomes? Have I calculated all the possibilities about what's going to happen? Um, all the people that I will affect or not and end up like two years investigating something and not doing anything, which probably should be, could be much more easier to say, oh, let's try this thing. And it's, is it going to be small? Yeah, great, done. And that's it. Uh, I, I think that the main, um, th this change of things that I, that I see, right? Kind of like um, motion, thought, and then movement is related to not be stuck in there forever thinking in something forever it's like we'll let's say for example um do we need the amount of knowledge to to feed our bodies of all, how all the micro microbes inside our body function together or is it something that we can just say like huh i like apples does it feel good yeah is it let's say uh is it making me um ill in the long term no great continue loop <laughs> that sort of of things um thank you gonzalo um <laughs> tony yeah thanks gonzalo um i've just uh, i've put a quote in the, the text box um by marcus aurelius which talks about um willingness to accept external events. That to me, I mean, I'm new to Stoicism, but that to me has always been problematic um, because it sort of implies that you are the sort of leaf in the wind and you have no control over external events. I'm just wondering what people think of that particular quote and how that relates to having some form of control um, over our, our external world. Philip. Yeah, I'd love to take this because this is one of my favorite quotes um actually uh and um the way that i always think about this quote um so um eva for you uh the it's willing acceptance now at this very moment of all external events that's what you need um yeah, because i don't think you can see the chat if you dial them by phone but anyways um yeah i i find this um actually really inspiring quote um because it doesn't actually, in my mind, um, say anything about my ability to influence things. It's like it's one step behind in a sense that now that something has happened, it's too late for me to think that, oh, I should have done this or I should have done that right? because um, this external event is already behind me. So the only thing I can do is, okay, I can live with it. I can base my decisions on it. I can let this event inform my future actions, but it's utterly futile to sit down and come up with ways that I could have changed what has happened. Um, and I don't need to, it's not healthy to, to dwell on it, to, um, yeah, to, 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 to try to change something that is entirely outside of my control. Um, so this is how I, um, yeah, what would I read out of this? And this is why I find this very liberating, actually, um, because um, yeah, it's, it's not necessarily my my character type that I would often do this. But you know, like I think we all fall into this trap every now and again that we think, "Oh, I made a mistake here. What should I have done differently?" Which is fine. Um, this is probably the most efficient way of us to learn. But there comes a point when it can become unhealthy. Um, where you know it keeps you up at night and you're sitting up and um, maybe you you know you're too afraid to take other decisions because oh, I made the wrong decision here and now I'm kind of stuck. But yeah, um, that's um, yeah, that's it. Uh, Gonzalo, and then back to Tony. Oh, Tony went first. I looked down and then up. Uh, Tony. Hey, thanks, Gonzalo. Um, no, I just wanted to say thank you, Philip. Um, I've never thought of it in that way, that particular quote. I, I've always just approached that quote as being, um, it seems overly passive. Um, you know, just accept everything that happens around you. It's, it's something that really doesn't fit in the stoic sort of um, narrative. Um, but now you've put it in that perspective, I really appreciate it. Yeah, you've enlightened me. Thank you. 
Uh, I was actually about to ask uh, something like that. Uh, what's the perspective that you're seeing this quote? Because it, it can have a lot of interpretations. Um, I don't know. My first thought when I read it was like a glass is falling. Uh, I perceived it. I have enough time to catch it or to keep thinking why the glass is falling, right? Uh, I, I think that that's, uh, for, for me, it was more related to, to that. Uh, it's like, accept that the glass is falling and catch it, or I don't know, choose to ignore it, whatever, but accept that the glass is falling. That's it. It's it's like um, the choice is yours to take of, about whether if you're going to dwell on the fact that why is the glass, is, why is the glass falling? Did I throw it away? Did I, uh, did, did the wind push something magically and throw it? Why? You can, you can start kind of like, um, ruminating on that and the glass will break and and you then you will start this um thing but sometimes it's just about that i don't know it depends on what you are seeing about the quote it's um um yeah i think yeah i i, I definitely agree with the per per perspective thing and i really like philip's uh, explanation and i would i would kind of go a level I mean, for for me, I would uh, slightly. Uh, for me, it's a different uh, interpretation, but it's somewhat similar. That I would not just focus on my actions and their consequences, but I would focus on the consequences themselves. I think, for example, like in the case of a falling glass, like there's no problem trying to catch it before it falls. But the idea is that you have to willingly accept what if you don't catch it in time and it falls. You have to just accept that it's going to break and then clean it up. Um, I think for me, and I really like uh, this started with, I think, Gonzalo, when he was emphasizing the consequences um, of your actions that I think, and um, and what kind of knowledge we can have of it, that it's, you have to just accept it. Um, and the consequences for me is the real, is the real um, perspective changer here. Because if I only talk about, um, if I only willingly accept events for what they are, then obviously that glass falling, I'm just going to stare at it as it just falls. I'm not going to do anything. But if I can catch it in time, great. If I can't, okay, that's just a willing acceptance of it. Um, and again, I think it's this it's this basis in knowledge that you just, you don't know. Like if, if you know what's going to happen, um, okay, then maybe act so that it doesn't happen. If you can't act, it doesn't happen, okay. But I think if you get the big question is if you don't have knowledge of something, the uncertainty, um, and you have to be willingly to accept the consequences of um, something you don't know. Um, because like, for example, are you going to catch it? And are you not going to catch that glass? Um, and if it's uncertain and whatever happens thereafter, you just have to accept it. So I think it's a consequences thing. And I think it's also as kind of to keep this train of thought it's a knowledge thing. You just um, uh, you have to accept within with what what's within your um, kind of mental sphere of influence, and that is knowledge itself and the decisions you make from it. Gonzalo. Uh, yes, but I also think that here is where knowledge has this problem, where where ignorance is a bliss, right? Uh, the, the moment that you start understanding a little bit about some things. Um, knowledge can be really uh, paralyzing because you start um, kind of like you start making comparisons and analogies and you might uh, go down the path of, oh, I don't know, software development is really complex and there are a lot of moving parts and the rest of the world is way more complex than software development. And then you, you kind of like um, get frozen by this. I, I think that, uh, to be honest, Buddhism says that, that Ignorance is a place because you just move without knowing the consequences. Because the consequences are not entirely out of in your power, let's say. It's like I cannot tell what another person will feel about, and that's outside of my control. Um, and the, mo the, the less you see, let's say, the more confident you are also uh, are in, in, in these terms. Okay. I will have a conversation when it ever needs to happen. I don't have to start ruminating on the conversation way before the, the conversation starts, right? 
Al Shaham. Um, yeah, but if you don't know there's a, a hole uh, up the path, you'll fall into it. And that's where I think uh, the negative uh, visualization uh, can come uh, in handy. If you uh, think, but like not all the possibilities, just um, within reason, don't uh, like throw yourself into a spiral uh, or this, you know, branching trees of, of uh, uh, possibilities and probabilities. That's not healthy. No, but if you're walking a path, uh, you can reasonably think about uh, hurdles um, or troubles you, you may have and prepare for those. And the more knowledge you have, the less uh, guessing you have to, to do. Um, so I'm for like reasonable uh, pursuit of knowledge. Um, but I think my character, if, if we <laughs> um, if talked about it, my, my character is to obsess with knowledge and to obsess with branching possibilities and drown myself uh, in these uh, spirals. So for me, um, not seeking so much uh, knowledge and not uh, going with the negative visualization uh, all the way to infinity is the healthy thing to do. Um, I think the stoic way is to find uh, the middle way. Um, Steve. Um, yeah, I I would definitely uh, second what you said about the um, uh, thinking of possibilities in the future. This um, uh, specifically negative visualization, but just generally thinking of possible consequences. Um, if we brought this up last week, I'm pretty sure when we were talking more about CPT, and we brought up the Seneca quote, um, uh, one of Seneca's quotes um, that uh, he talks about um, just thinking through all the possibilities. Um, and I, I really don't remember the quote. I'm not sure even sure if we mentioned it last week, just somebody brought up the fact that he does mention this. Um, and I think, well, he was a political advisor. He had to have thought of all political contingencies, these possibilities that could happen from his actions. Um, but I, I do also like to obsess over knowledge. And I think it's OK as long as you also willingly accept um, that it's just knowledge. I think maybe there's two sides of the coin. I think Gonzalo also said sometimes you can um, distress over all that knowledge. And, oh, this is going to happen. Oh, this is going to happen. Oh, this is going to happen. But um, I think if you approach knowledge as something that's not going to hurt you, that's just a thing. It's knowledge. It's a logical consequence. There's nothing you can do about it. There's that also the element of willing acceptance in there that you um, you, also, you also can't go to knowledge seeking without willingly accepting that that's the knowledge you learn. Um, of course, you should also keep in mind that it's you're, you're open, that it may be wrong knowledge, that you may continue building on it or rejecting it if there's new knowledge, but you should always um, willingly accept the fact that uh, you, if you learn something, it's it's not going to hurt you. It's um, maybe touching upon um, the passions that it's nothing to get um, uh, distressed over. It's nothing to get um, really rowdy over. It's just there and it's something to willingly accept. Um, and I think that's a good technique. Like once you willingly accept the knowledge and the consequences, then you can willingly accept when it happens. If it does happen as a consequence of one of your actions, then you're already prepared to willingly accept it happens. Um, and I think that also goes into into good decision making. That's good input. Uh, if you um, if you can willingly accept the consequences of all your actions, then you're I think a bit more confident uh, and courageous in choosing one of those actions to take. Um, because you're not fearful of what's going to happen. You know what's going to happen. Um, and I think there's more ethics about which action and which decision to make. But aside from that, um, you'd be better prepared to accept the consequences of your actions and you'd be better prepared to make a decision because you're, um, 
and you're a bit more confident. I think confidence is a better word here than courageous to, um, uh, because you're not going to be surprised. You're not even surprised now of what's going to happen because you, you know, or you have a tendency to know a possibility. Um, Tony. Yeah, I think there's a real danger that we can overthink certain situations and end up spiraling down some rabbit hole. I think for me personally, um, being of sort of average intelligence is, um, is quite an advantage. <laughs> It's a um, very Socratic thing to say. <laughs> I think Socrates. There's a there's a famous story of um, <clears throat> of him going into a. Um, uh, there was an argument he was having a public debate, and uh, um, the other guy was basically making fun of him for being ugly, and all he did was just uh, just um, uh, troll him with the logic of what it means to be ugly and beautiful. So I think uh, there's no shame in being um, uh, this or that as long as you have a good head about it and the decisions to make. Because I think what Stoicism gives you is that like empowerment to like not care about. This is something Zeno also, Zeno kind of took from the cynics. I think this is where that element in Stoicism comes from because it takes from the cynics this idea of who cares what other people think. I mean, you have to to an extent in order to make good decisions and understand what's going on. but if you know your decision is good and wise, then you have to stop listening to um, that kind of, I guess, excessive critique that doesn't really matter to an extent. Socrates being called ugly or um, you knowing that you're of average intelligence, um, which I don't think you are. <laughs> I think everybody here um, uh, has uh, has a good intelligence about them if, uh, um, uh, I, I I can't imagine anybody knowledge seeking very avidly. Um, I also tend to also believe of this growing intelligence, um, this that intelligence is never static, something, something you can always build on. Um, I don't think anybody is of average intelligence, so to speak. Uh, if it's average, it's only because maybe it's a moving average, but you're, you always have that ability to change what you know. Um, I'll, I'll, um, several hands. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm going to go back to Lily first because we haven't heard her in a while, then Gonzalo, then then uh, Thank Lily. you. Um, I was wondering if the element of surprise fucks up stoicism in a way, like if something happens that you really didn't anticipate at all, if that makes it harder to be stoic, or if the the high art of stoicism is just to to always be stoic, like to, to have the, um, the, men the mental set to whatever happens, it doesn't matter, um, it's okay. And uh, I don't know if that's possible, but that would also mean that, that you don't need to know all the ways things could go down. And it's actually probably even more healthy because you don't even have to think about it or drive yourself mad about what other possibilities there might be. Um, I, Gonzalo and Shikham, I assume you're going to touch upon, uh, the discussion before that question. Um, so if, oh, okay. Um, but, uh, I'll keep the, just get a question from Lily about surprise in the back of my mind. I'm going to let Gonzalo and Shikham speak, and then we're definitely going to touch upon it. Um, but I want them the chance to speak. So, uh, Gonzalo and then Shikham. Uh, to, to be honest, I, I have a um, kind of like I have a mutating idea about knowledge and, and intelligence. I think that for me, intelligence is just related to solving a problem with whatever you have at hand. It's like it doesn't matter um, whether it, uh, kind of like your test values, your test scores, that sort of things uh, are bullshit. Basically, uh, it's like uh, with what happens what happens today and it at this moment are you able to resolve something or not um to some extent that's that's the first thing it, it's that that's um i i think i'm also average intelligence i i'm 
I never score more than 110 in IQ IQ test. So it's average. It's like most of people are. Uh, I think that it's just curiosity mostly. Um, and and for Lily, I think that I think that that's that's a problem with with the let's say for me negative visualization started to work when I started to consider the worst thing kind of like I I didn't consider consider all of them but just the worst parts it's like if I go this will the world end or not no okay what's the worst thing that it would happen this thing oh okay not that bad let's keep moving I I, I think that that's um the helpful part about uh, about um stoicism and the next part is related to let's say to know that you can resolve whatever the world throws out you it's like that's you're learning to do that in a moving process of it, it's it's really inside my brain it's like a circle um that it's inside itself it's really weird it's like a spiral going on because you're learning how to deal with the world by learning how to deal with the world uh, with a very small step about saying, OK, this let's wait one second before we act. Let's let's do that first. And then you start creating this uh, snowball of, of experience that helps you to deal with the rest of the things. I also think that that's what you do. And that's why you don't freak out that easy. I mean, when, when you start having confidence about the framework that you're applying, you start seeing that your confidence grow from my perspective. At least that's what's happening to me. And, and it's, um, it's slightly unreal, but at the same time, slightly dangerous for me because I'm like in this confidence point where I might slip. <laughs> And yeah, I, I'm trying to be on on the not the slip side. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Shakan. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so. Uh, yeah. First, I, I do agree that curiosity is more important than plain intelligent intelligence. Um. And uh, I think it, it can also uh, bring up uh, the question of uh, biological uh, determinism, uh, nature uh, versus uh, nurture. Um, because I'm more uh, on the side of uh, nurture. Um, it doesn't matter what, uh, or okay, it, it, it can influence, but your future is not determined by your uh, your genes uh, with what you were born uh, with. Um, having uh, the curiosity, uh, the will to improve yourself, is way more important than like if you scored this or that uh, on uh, IQ tests, in my opinion. And and to that. Um, uh, last week we talked about uh, stoic uh, techniques, and one of them uh, was something that the sage. What was it? Uh, if um, he, uh, um, contemplating the sage. Contemplating the, the sage. Yeah. Thanks. Um, and through through this, through thinking, for example, how would uh, uh, Marcus Aurelius deal with this situation? you can hijack other people's experience and intelligence uh, to help uh, you get uh, um, like better decisions and better actions. Um, so the ability to learn from other people's uh, mistakes uh, is, I think, also like a very a stronger tool than just being intelligent and uh, uh to uh to lily 
Eh, Quien surprise eh, ruine yo eh, estoy que preparedness. Um, I think if you know what your values are, then you're prepared for everything. Um, if you know you'll meet uh, every uh, situation uh, with uh, courage, wisdom, temperance, uh, <laughs> and the, the, the last one, uh, justice. Justice. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, then, really, you're already you're already prepared. Uh, the exact details uh, might elude you, um, but you can count on yourself um, to try and get uh, to the to the best uh, decision. One, uh, like I think, giving yourself time to to think about these values, uh, to reflect, would really make you prepare for every every surprise. Um, that's it. Um, Mm -hmm. um, just before I jump to you, Philip, um, I just wanted to mention, Lily, that uh, his article that Philip posted is, um, um, I'm, I'm actually just quickly reading it, but there's a good passage in the near the beginning, um, and this touches upon a very Stoic theme and a cognitive behavioral theme as well, uh, that the Stoics never said that they would, um, although they're prepared, they never said that they wouldn't be surprised and they never said that they wouldn't feel what they call judgments or first opinions. Like they know they know they're human and they know that they can't um, control every little bit of thought because ultimately they know that they can only control their thoughts that they're conscious about. They know that as with their biological bodies that they just are going to have random thoughts and feelings but the point is that they so they, they 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 admit actually in the article the story the stoic admits that he has a a, a feeling of surprise or awe or um, distress but then he he stops he catches himself and then he um he realizes that there's nothing to be afraid of so it's um i think this i think stoicism very much allows for these kinds of emotions but it's it's about what you do after you catch it's, it's stoicism is more about um uh, catching emotions afterwards and preventing reactions to the emotions. So I think that's maybe a, a good way to put it, um, Philip. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, I actually took my hand uh, down again because uh, between the last three speakers, uh, basically everything I wanted to say has already been brought up. Um, just maybe um, two small things. Um, I really enjoyed this discussion about epistemology and um, like how we know what we know and is knowledge about ourselves and knowledge about the outside world possible and to what degree um, does it influence um, us? And maybe there's a topic in there for a whole discussion, perhaps, I don't know. Um, but the other thing um, to your question, Lily, um, the only thing that I um, can still add that has been brought up yet is um, the idea of, um, I think, I, I can't remember where it comes from exactly, but um, the idea that the sage, the wise person, that doesn't actually really exist, but something that um, many Stoics aspire um, or strive towards being. The idea is that um, the wise person would always align his will um, with the events around him. So he would never actually be surprised um, because, um, yeah, it happens, and immediately as it happens, you 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 will the very same thing that just happened to be exactly the only thing that could have or should have happened. Um, but of course, like I'm not a sage. I don't think uh, a sage is like a real person, and it's never meant to be a real person. It's always just something to um, like a mental model, something to aspire to. Um, but yeah, like um, that's why I actually put the article in. Um, in the text because i thought it kind of fits quite nicely with your question about um what actually happens when you find yourself in a situation and um like steve said um it's totally normal and it's totally fine that you have this 
impression of oh something is happening but then you take a step back and you um you interrogate the the feelings as they arise and you um you deal with them rationally and not um emotionally uh yeah um, that's, that's it gonzalo i think was the next ah okay yeah gonzalo uh, a really nerdy fact um there was um there was uh, an uh, it, it's related to meditation so if you're struggling with surprise um there was a really interesting study about some buddhist monks um they were doing a cat scan and firing um fireworks next to them in the cat scan to re to understand how their brain works and none of the buddhist monks were actually surprised about that they were just accepting as the noise was a kind of like starting to rise with their bodies it's really creepy because it kind of like as soon as the velocity of the sound started to reach them let's say there was like a, a peak that it was really small and that's it but for the rest of the humans they were like uh, a, a really steep peak they were startled it lasted more than it should because they were like um, racing up about all the emotions that they were having. They were following them all together. And, and, and I think that that's basically what this um, um, comment from Philip um, was related to, right? It's like the more you learn about you, you let's say, in, in those terms, the more you um, catch yourself. You're, you're there for you. Let's say that's the real part for me. It's like you're there for you, and and yeah, it's really weird. Thank you, Gonzalo. Could you actually share that story? Like, could you share? I don't know if you have a link to the um to the study. It's a YouTube video. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that'd be interesting. Um, that's a really good. Like, I'm I'm wondering if um because what I planned originally for the next two weeks is that on the second meeting on the passions. We would focus on anger just because that's such a huge topic in stoicism especially with senecas on anger that's probably unavoidable and maybe something we have a separate discussion of but for next week i wonder if we should have uh we should touch upon other emotions besides anger and include in their surprise we may have um something more to say about it and it might also be interesting the reason why i ask for your source gonzalo is because maybe we also look at other um uh um cognitive studies on the real neurological effects of these emotions on humans. Because I think it's also interesting, the past couple of weeks we've been talking about cognitive behavioral therapy. It might be interesting to kind of mesh our knowledge of stoicism and how it explains and deals with emotions and what, cog what cognitive and neurological or neuroscientific studies have a say about um, uh, emotions. It may take me a little while because I think it's a TED video that I read where this other monk is explaining this this study, but I will try to search it. It's um, yeah, I have a lot of links inside my head, <laughs> and I have to sort out which one is. But yeah, I will share probably in the Telegram chat if I cannot find it before the end of the meeting. Okay, that's fine. Um, but yeah, I was going to say uh, you this meeting I only made until five thirty. Um, but that's only because I didn't think this meeting needed to any longer. Um, uh, it's not a huge topic. It's just an introduction to um, a, an introductory discussion on how Stoics think the mind works, essentially, in order to preface the next two weeks on the passions. Um, because I think, actually, this is a really good discussion because we kept talking about um, emotions like surprise um, that really good really do preface and, and the idea of knowledge and how we can be distressful about something like knowledge and i think it's a really good preface for the next two weeks um i have no other prompts that was a really good question i think I, i'm really glad i made that question because that opened up a whole pandora box of, of, of other questions um does anybody have anything else to say 
I have, there, there's no, nothing else I, I wanted to mention. The only thing I wanted to mention was I had one last idea. There was another connection I made. And I'm wondering if there's a deeper connection between Stoicism and why Zeno was such an anarchist. Um, so I had a few thoughts that after the passions, we may do, for example, another meetup on Buddhism and Stoicism, because I think there, now we come to another crossroads where there's a deeper connection between the two that we keep seeing. Um, and the other thing was, I, I noticed we never did a, a Stoic meetup on Stoicism and politics, because if Zeno was so heavily influenced by his political beliefs, maybe it's maybe it's good we do something about that. Because I'm thinking if maybe Zeno was such an anarchist, or at least something close to it, something against powerful state institutions, um, maybe because he had a, um, uh, um, there was a connection between um, his ideal of what you can control. And I often think that um, just as the last comment about what that meetup could look like, um, you can never control like this absolute control that Gonzalo was uh, interpreting against that it's not really a useful way to think about control. Um, but I wonder if that's why we see so much state violence and state repression, because they have this idea that, okay, ultimately the only way you can truly control people is to physically control them um, violently, right, at, against their will. And I wonder if that's perhaps why Zeno kind of turned towards anarchism, or at least it's not anarchism like the 19th century philosophers thought of it, but some early conception of it. I wonder if that's why he thought of that utopia, because um, uh, there's a deep connection between, at least for him, uh, against being against state power and being against external violent control. And I wonder if that's, there's just a connection. So I have a couple of things in mind. So passions and then maybe Buddhism and, and politics and stoicism um, as, if, as the next lineup of meetups. Um, I have uh, my usual couple of questions at the end. Um, for one, does anybody have any other suggestions about meetups? Does anybody have any other topics about in, in Stoicism, any Stoic philosophers or any related material that they would like to discuss? Tony. Yeah, I think the sort of academic study of how you know Stoicism interrelates to other disciplines is really useful. But for me personally, it's how to apply Stoic philosophy to your day-to-day -day life, which is really important. Um, you know, I really do enjoy reading um, all, all about stoicism, but it's really the, the practical application of that in real life situations, which just for me personally is quite important. Okay. Um, hmm. um, I have to think about how to structure it. I'm only one man and there's, um, uh, maybe I can have one other person to um, help organize because I'm also thinking that, um, uh, yeah, I think there's no other way about it. I think sometimes we just have to have some meetings that are more academic and some meetings that are more practical. Um, but we are in a practical kind of, um, this, is, this is an exception, this meeting. But generally in the past few weeks, we've been in a kind of practical mindset. So we should continue that. And um, uh, Gonzalo. Yeah, I, I was about to ask is if it's more related to, to techniques, what, what sort of, of practice would you like to to um to to to, to talk about if, if it's like um more from, from a sharing perspective, like I struggled with this, I implemented I fail all these times by doing this and this is the current soon to be failure or that sort of things or um what what would you like to let's say to talk about the, the practice itself i think that that's the question sure so as an example this morning um i wake up quite early maybe about 5 a.m so my brain historically is raced because i've got so many things to do but now what i've started doing is just saying to myself, is this something I can control or not control? So straight away, 95% of all those issues that I have disappear because most of them I just can't control. So it's just these very simple, that's the probably the most simple technique you can ever use. But just 
tips, hints and tips of how we can sort of just live an easier, better life because, you know, academic study is very important, but if we don't apply it and have techniques of how to apply it, it's all just remains academic. Um, I think it's good that net, net we do another meetup on uh, that list of techniques I brought up in the last session on CBT. Um, I had a huge slide of basically everything that I could find from, especially Donald Robertson and um, his advice that CBT and Stoicism gives in terms of techniques to help um, live a live a natural life, basically live live a life according to your own nature. Um, so perhaps we expand upon that. Perhaps we keep touching upon those different techniques that we listed. Because we only, um, last week, we only focused on, for example, the dichotomy of control, uh, a little bit of negative visualization and um, uh, judgments versus uh, um, uh, um, actual events. Um, but we could also go further than that. Um, we never did an entire session like I wanted to do on journaling. Uh, or we never did an entire session on, um, I mean, next week we should do, a. next week we're gonna follow the same format we have in the past. The first hour is gonna be a discussion and the second hour is gonna be practice. So what we could do is the first hour next week, we could um, focus on uh, Chrysippus's The Passions, um, a little bit of what Cicero talks about. Um, uh, I think uh, Epictetus and Seneca are really good if we talk about emotions. Um, and the practice part, I don't know. Um, I, I've always wanted to do something more guiding, but I've always been a little bit weary of it because I myself don't know how to approach that. I don't know how to guide other people in like a practice session on how to practice these concepts. Um, usually we just discuss practical ways, um, but um, let me try and find, and everybody else is welcome to try and also find uh, maybe if there's a kind of a short program, training session program already, created by Robertson or um, somebody else that we can basically mimic and do in, in the meetup. Um, uh, my last question, uh, which I only started doing last week was, does anybody have any feedback for me? Um, because of this idea of improvement, um, I can't do these meetups alone. Um, and it would be really great to hear um, and uh, don't worry, I've willingly accepted any kind of negative comments anybody can give me. Um, so if you have any kind of critique, positive or negative, um, that would be really, really useful for me. And so Abdul. Yeah, thanks. Um, it was an interesting session. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, I just wanted to say, yeah, I, I would agree with um, Tony about having more hands-on or applicable um, session because I mean that's what attracted me to the stoicism in the first place. It's something that you can apply in, in your daily lives, in your daily life. Um, but yeah, I mean it's at the end up to the majority. It's not okay because I want that. But again, it, it's it, it's nice to see variety. But perhaps uh, one of the uh, questions that I have, uh, I've noticed the uh, uh, modern stoicism uh, sort of movement. Uh, I, I just, yeah, maybe it'll be interesting to discuss what's, what are the differences between the old stoicism and modern stoicism. Why, why such movement is in the first place? Why, why uh, do you think that uh, some practices in ancient, let's call it, stoicism uh, is critiqued or refused or, I mean, probably it's one of these. I mean, presumably, I don't know, but um, yeah, it'll be interesting to know uh, because it's maybe it's hard for me to come to conclusion with this regards because I'm quite new to uh, stoicism. Thank you. No, you're not. You're definitely not in the major, uh, minority. Um, I can say so. Um, that every, pretty much everybody has always um, said to um, uh, focus more on the practicality, and I don't think that's wrong of us to do, especially because that's what the Stoics wanted us to do. That the whole point of philosophy for the ancients was to practice it, not to think about it in an armchair. So absolutely. Um, 
uh, just as a last note, I'm, I'm constantly keeping in like keeping updated with the lockdown rules. So as soon as I, I have a weird feeling that at some point in March or early April, they're going to start allowing more and more people to congregate outside. So I'm just um, uh, keeping updated with that. So at any point we're allowed to meet outside, we can, we can start meeting in person. Um, to people like Tony, um, we'll obviously continue having online meetings. Uh, so um, we're not going to forego those. Um, and the weather's getting better. So it looks like we'll be able to meet outside whenever the lockdown ends, um, perhaps earlier than, than we thought. Um, thank you, everybody, for your help and your feedback. Sorry, Steve. I was just going to say, yeah. we're about three, three and a half hours from Berlin. So it's a good excuse to get over there again. So, oh, okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll <laughs> right, you're, um, you. you're in Poland. I completely forgot you're not in the UK yeah. right now. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you're more than welcome to come. Um, uh, I, it wouldn't be a two hour thing too. We can spend a, we can spend a, a stoic evening together if you want to do some practicing stoic techniques. Um, I have a question. Are you based in Wrocław or where are you based? No, I'm just outside Poznan. Ah, all right. So you could hop, uh, could hop on the train and would be here quickly. I know Absolutely. that train, that's why. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's very convenient. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking for an excuse to get back to Berlin. Right. Gonzalo. Oh, and then um, me. Yeah, the, um, I, I think I, I will need to, to check. I think that there's a really good um, introduction to, I think that I have it. I just have to search for it. Um, to to mindfulness, um, I think that the, the first uh, the introduction about kind of like catching your 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 thoughts, it's really good. It's really helpful for let's say this sort of um, introduction to passions. I think that um, uh, being able to observe the starting of your thought, it's it's a really helpful um, tool uh, to have. Um, I just have to search it. I can share it in the Telegram group. Uh, that's the first part. Um, the the other part, um, I think that maybe um, we can have, um, I don't want to say another Telegram group with uh, announcements only. I think that there are some feature in Telegram where you can create um, uh, like, like announces. Um, so that we can split a little bit the group for having conversations versus the announcements. If you would like to just receive the announcements about the link, the meeting, and that's it, we can just just uh, subscribe to that group. If we can have like fully conversations and, and, and discuss and do more things, um, we can use the Telegram group to talk about things. Um, that's, that, that will be one suggestion. Um, I also was to ask if there's kind of like, um, if, if there's a problem of using more of the Telegram group, kind of like uh, talk about um, more things in it. Like I found this helpful or I'm struggling with this. Um, does anybody have some I don't know, project uh, organization, stoic way, sort of information. Um, sometimes that's also, uh, I don't know, helpful. Yeah. Um, and just before uh, to go to Lily, just to answer your specific later questions about technicalities. Um, yeah, I think there is a way to do Telegram announcements. Um, I can make another group called Berlin Stoics Announcements, um, and that could work. Um, we used to have a Discord group. I originally had a, a conceptualized Discord, but the, I think there's a couple of problems with that. For one, most people don't know about it. And most people don't use it. Most people are not going to download it if if we just ask them to. Most people stick to something they know. And the other thing is that I actually don't. I wouldn't recommend Discord now because it's um we still wouldn't be using it. It's like it's it's like Slack. And it's you, so with so many channels. It's we're not going to get its full use out of it for just what we want to do. We don't need it, I think. 
Um, so let me try and create another Telegram group for announcements. Absolutely, if you want to put in something into Telegram about um, I'm dealing with this or I'm dealing with that, that's that's fine. Uh, especially, maybe we what we do from now on. Actually, I had a thought. From now onwards, we end the meeting after my questions, and we end the meeting with. What do we do next? And I'm not talking about in the next meeting, but what do we do as a curriculum? Like, for example, over the next week, um, should everybody focus on journaling? Should everybody focus on negative visualization? Should everybody focus on catching their emotions and thoughts the first time they pop in? And so we kind of, the next week over, we share stories about how that worked and didn't work. So I'm wondering if we should maybe end the meeting with that. Um, mm -hmm. I'll come back to that at the end, but I want the others just to be able to speak. So, um, uh, Lily? Um, I just wanted to say, uh, first of all, I, I feel like my philosophic brain uh, is uh, starting to train again. <laughs> I think it's kind of more like a muscle and it feels really great. So thank you so much, guys. And uh, you said you asked for feedback and I think we shouldn't just say always negative things, but also positive things. and. Uh, I think especially you, Steve, like how much uh, obviously passion and work you put in it is not natural and normal. And we like I am very thankful for having this person take care of it and putting this energy in it. So I just wanted to say thank you. I think it's really wonderful that you take care of us in that way. <laughs> thank you, Lily. <laughs> thank you. Um, Abdul. Yeah, thanks. Um... I just want to say um, I'm running into another meeting. So, um, yeah, uh, thanks very much for hosting this session. Uh, nice meeting you, Lily. Nice seeing you, everyone. Um, see you next week. Bye. Bye, Abdul. Thank you. Um, uh, so just to close out, um, for one, Lily, if you would like to join the Telegram group that we keep speaking about, um, you can um, uh, send me, uh, you don't have to do it in the chat, actually. You can just do it on, um, I don't know, I forget if you found us on um, Meetup or the website, but in either case, if you send me a message, send me your number and I can add you to the Telegram group if you're, if you're interested. I don't um, have to do them yet, but I'm buying a new phone with more storage where I can fit, fit more apps on. <laughs> then okay. I will join you for sure. Okay. Um, and uh, what should we end with? What should we do over the next week? Um, should we, uh, as Gonzalo just pointed out, maybe we focus on our emotions, catch them. And um, I think we, we have to propose to do something a bit more specific than that, um, than just catching them. Um, so for example, what do we do when we catch them? Um, and perhaps we try a couple of things. When we catch all our emotions over the next week, when we catch ourselves in a kind of, not just an emotion, but a passion with the Stoics are talking about, this irrational, really overwhelming surge of emotion, like big surprise or a lot of just vicious anger, something that really, or, or another kind of big passion like uh, the Stoics talked about, lust. So some big passion, and then focus on a couple of maybe passion management techniques, we'll call them. Uh, one of them could be contemplating the sage. Um, think about what would a sage do? What would an ideal stoic do in this situation um, of an emotion? And uh, two, I think the other important thing we should do as stoics is consider that these are just judgments and automatic thoughts. These are not real events, so to speak, right? These are just emotions we have. Um, and it's okay if we wanna like, let's say we feel angry, maybe there's something to really be angry about. But I think the important point to make is that we, should, we shouldn't get caught up and simply react to our emotions. We should catch them, understand that they are just automatic thoughts and judgments. They aren't events. Um, that happened to us. These are something that we can control ourselves. Um, and then imagine um, what would an ideal stoic do? What would a sage do? Um, does that work for everybody? Is that like a good, maybe a good starting way to, to, to go throughout the next week and then come back next week when we talk about the passions and explore how did it go? Yeah, definitely. Um, I would totally be up for something like this, for sure. Okay. 
Okay. Um, so everybody focus on that, um, not your emotions, and uh, make sure you catch them uh, uh, and think about what to do um, uh, when you catch them. And Lily. Can I add something? Sorry. Uh, I notice more and more that I think a lot of my emotions are habitual emotions that I uh, react to things because that's the way I used to react to things. But like kind of like I'm a different person than like 10 years ago, but yet my emotions are often still like the same, like I, as the way of being brought up maybe, or the things that people told me a lot when I was a kid or, or younger. So maybe also it helps to identify, is this a true emotion now, or is this just a habitual emotion? Thank you. Yeah. Um, that's a good point because when you catch them, um, I, I always traditionally have thought, um, uh, not now, but I think a lot of times we, as a Stoics, we might try and say, uh, you know, these emotions are not us, you know, these are just automatic thoughts. But I think sometimes we have to understand emotions are a part of us um, and not detach them completely from our identity. Um, we just can't let them control us. Um, so I like that idea. And the reason why I'm saying that I like that idea is because um, uh, um, are they, um, are you asking, are they kind of one time very unique passions or, or are they part of our natural rhythm apart from that? Those are kind of the two different emotions you're talking about. Um, if it's the natural rhythm, hmm. you know, I think it's, more it's, it's it's more like a trigger that certain things always triggered certain emotions but that maybe now my my uh adult person would actually have the choice to like react in a different emotion to it does that make sense yeah um um I'm just trying okay. to put that into practice. Yeah, yeah. So, so what? Um... I'll tell you an example, okay? Um, so when I was uh, younger, I actually I was always a loner, and my my uh, family always told me that's wrong or that's weird or why are you a loner? You know. So till this day, I have often the feeling when when I am alone, I have the emotion of like of I don't know unhappiness because I don't feel like it's right, you know, or it's it's supposed to be. But then I catch myself and I, I reflect on this and I realize, actually, I love to be alone. It's just great right now to be alone. I'm actually not even sad about it. That's what I mean, like these conditioned emotions that come up. But maybe I'm making stuff up. It's okay. <laughs> no, no, you're fine. Um, I think uh, just before she kind of speaks, this is, I was trying to think of what I was trying to say before, but I think there's a third thing. So judgments versus uh, events, um, contemplating the sage, but there's a third thing we can do, which I draw, I draw from what you're saying, is that we can try what, and examine, when we catch our emotions, we can try and examine the root causes of our emotions. I think that's what you're really saying, is that like examine and contemplate where do those emotions come from? Like, why why is it I react that way? Is it from childhood? Is it because I've been conditioned to react that way? I think that's a really good point, that if we want to ultimately resolve our emotions, if we don't like the way we react, I think we ultimately also have to um, discuss the, or at least treat the um, the root causes of them, because that, I think, helps us um, understand why they're even there. Shakam. Uh, it's a, I think it's a very important uh, discussion and ha I have a lot, a lot to say. Um, but uh, I think it's, uh, yeah, it's uh, already six uh, and people uh, have to go. Uh, sorry, Lily. Uh, it's it's great uh, that uh, that you're here uh, and uh, you brought uh, um, a lot of uh, important uh, topics. But uh, yeah, it's time to practice temperance and and say goodbye. I think. But just before that, <laughs> um, from uh, James Clear Atomic uh, Habits, um, we can only be rational and logical 
after we have been emotional. The primary mode of our brain is to feel. The secondary is to think. Mm. Our first respon response, the fast, non-conscious portion of the brain, is optimized for feeling and uh, anticipating. Our sec second response, the slow, conscious uh, portion uh, of the brain, is the part that does the thinking. He's not a stoic uh, author, but uh, he has a lot of practical things that uh, I think gel very well with uh, the stoic way um, of thinking. Um, and so what I would say, and I think also uh, it would be in, in uh, the, Bo the, the Buddhist way, you have this, these feelings uh, that comes from uh, unused patterns that uh, maybe you got uh, from your childhood, um, maybe they used to be useful, but now uh, you're grown as a person and you don't really need them, but it, they're still coming up. So giving yourself this, this moment um, to to feel, to let go of the feeling, and do the reflection and the thinking, and then you'll be free of uh, of those uh, initial uh, feelings. Yeah. Thank you, Shikam. Um, uh, Gonzal, yeah, um, we're tending towards the end of the meeting, um, but I... Uh, no, if... I, I just wanted to say that in instead of asking um, what's, let's say, what's the, you said asking what's the origin, trying to search where where, where it's coming from, right? Or if you can overanalyze it a little bit to see, um, I, I will suggest not not try to do that, but rather try to um to write exactly what you feel instead of analyzing uh where is it coming from try to write something about it uh, i think it will be more helpful uh that to to understand the, the fullness of the feeling first rather than understanding uh where is it coming from because sometimes when you're when, when you're searching where it's coming from you are avoiding it somehow uh and and i think that writing something about the feeling that you're having it's way more powerful let's say in order to let it go because the process is it comes it fills you you feel it completely and then you drop it and that's it but you just have to wait let's say that's um I, I will suggest that instead of, uh, for, mm. for the, especially if we are going to, um, mm. let's say, use it as a suggestion to, to deal with 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 emotions, I, I think it's more helpful to to frame it like that, like like try to write something small, maybe a few words. Um, I'm not saying write a novel about what you're feeling. <laughs> I, I'm saying more like uh, just a few words, a, a few things, and that's it. Uh, also, not yeah. share it with anyone. It's just a, it's yours. Let's say that's a, my my take on it. At least that's more helpful for me. Thank you. Um, no, yeah, that's a good point. We also don't want to ruminate on the emotion, right? Too much. Yeah, I think that's what you're getting at. We don't want to ruminate, and I think we also don't want to misappropriate where the emotional cause is. If you're in the heat of an emotion and you think about the cause, and all of a sudden you you say you put the blame on somebody else, that's also wrong. So I think you're right. I think maybe when I um, uh, write into the Telegram chat, we specifically frame it like pause, wait, and maybe a suggestion to write a few words about it because you need to, not literally, but a few words about it to um, uh, really digest what's going on. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, I'm closing out the meeting. Um, so I'll see everybody next week. Thank you everybody for joining. Bye-bye guys, bye -bye. have a really good day.